the final months of the Second World War. In Europe, the tide had turned. The Nazis had been rebuffed in a final costly fight, the Battle of the Bulge. But still the Third Reich would not concede defeat. Allied forces entered Germany in January of 1945. British and Americans from the West, Russians from the East. In Berlin, Adolf Hitler spent his last months in a subterranean fortress, the Führer Bunker. What exactly went on in Hitler's hiding place? And what did it look like? Do traces remain despite two attempts to obliterate it? Using the latest technology and eyewitness accounts, we'll reconstruct the infamous bunker, exposing the place where one of the most wicked men in history met his end. Modern-day Berlin, a city united and at peace. Half a century ago, it was a different place. At the end of April in 1945, the capital of Hitler's Third Reich was in ruins. For months, it had been heavily bombarded by Allied aircraft. Soviet artillery had shelled the city for days as Red Army troops advanced towards the center. Their objective? The symbols of the hated Nazi regime. The Reich Chancellery, the headquarters of the SS, and the Gestapo. Under the rubble was the bunker where Hitler had been hiding for almost three months. The bunker has captured the public imagination, mainly because it was the final death rattle, grotesque death rattle of the Third Reich. German resistance was sporadic but fanatical. Berlin's defenders were mostly teenagers, fiercely loyal members of the Hitler Youth. Many German soldiers, including officers, had fled the city. They hoped to surrender to British and American troops rather than face the rumored savagery of the Soviets. For the city's civilians, conditions had become intolerable weeks earlier. Many of them were so desperate to get food ready for the siege that they would still stand in line in the street, uh, either queuing for bread or even for water, because by that stage the water supplies had broken down as well as electricity. And many women were slaughtered or literally blown to pieces uh, in the open. Few people who witnessed Hitler's final weeks are alive today. But two who once walked the corridors of the Führerbunker survive. Armin Lehmann was a member of the Hitler Youth. Given bicycles with bazookas strapped to them, these boys were ordered to take on huge Russian tanks. Armin was a runner. His job took him to the bunkers of the Reich Chancellery and to the Führer bunker, which lay nearby. He was one of the last people to see Hitler alive. The last days I had no conception whatsoever. Um, what time it was, sometimes I even lost the sense of it was day or night because uh, there was so much smoke out there. Rocker Smish was a young sergeant in Hitler's SS bodyguard detachment. He was also the bunker's telephone operator. There were civilians as well that had our telephone number, friends and acquaintances. They called us asking for help. Goebbels tried to reassure them, and I did too, that they should hold out. Yes, they said, but people are being raped. On the 20th of April, 1945, as a thousand British and American planes rained bombs on Berlin, Adolf Hitler descended into his bunker for the last time. It was his 56th birthday. Several top Nazi officers urged him to surrender to the Allies. He refused. They urged him to leave Berlin while he still could. He would not. When the first artillery shells um, landed uh, close to the bunker, Hitler came out unshaven from his room um, and uh, yelling, I mean, appalled and sort of gesticulating, saying, what's happening? And Hitler was shaken 
um, to realize that the Russians really were at the gates of Berlin. As the Red Army began shelling the city, Josef Goebbels, Hitler's propagandist, joined his Führer. He brought his wife, Magda, and their six children with him. After the assassination attempt on Hitler's life in July of 1944, even top officers were relieved of their sidearms and searched before being allowed in the Führer's presence. By late April, only his inner circle remained. His mistress, Ava Braun, Goebbels and his family, and a few trusted aides. The bunker's four-meter thick walls protected the small group. Huge ventilators circulated air 11 meters below ground. There was enough food, water, and champagne to last for one more month. In Berlin, the secret bunkers of World War II are largely forgotten. Just occasionally, usually by accident, one comes to light. In 1990, workers were preparing a site for a concert to celebrate the fall of the war. The Reich Chancellery and gardens had once stood on the same spot. After the wall was constructed in 1960, it became a so-called death zone, booby-trapped by East German police to discourage escapees. The workers stumbled on an underground structure that had been used by the SS Motor Corps known as the FARA, or Driver's Bunker. On its walls, grim pictures from the time remain. This bunker also contained artifacts, each one with a story behind it. A dagger that had been worn by a member of the loyal Hitler Youth. Remnants of an Enigma machine used to code and to decode secret messages sent by the German High Command. and petrol cans, perhaps those used to douse the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun after death. The two had married in the Führer bunker less than 48 hours before their suicide. Although Hitler's underground lair has inspired much speculation since the war ended, strangely, very little is known about it. Its location is unmarked, its true dimensions uncertain, but for those who experienced life there in the final weeks of the war, the memories are vivid. We heard it if a shell or a heavy bomb hit the exit tower. There was concrete, we could hear that. But otherwise we heard nothing, nothing at all. Down there it was completely quiet. A humming of ventilation, nothing more. It's a minute. You left the bunker, especially during the last days. It was like the steel hail. The one officer who was there described it as a mixture of hysteria and resignation. People were drinking very heavily indeed. Many of them, in a sort of fairly drunken way, were discussing the best way to commit suicide. Was it with a pistol or was it with a cyanide capsule? On the 30th of April, Ava Braun ingested poison. Hitler took no chances. He used both cyanide and a pistol. Their bodies were carried up to the Chancellery Gardens above, doused with petrol, and burned. Goebbels and his wife directed an SS orderly to shoot them, but not before they'd murdered their six children. They, in fact, had been drugged first, and uh, then, uh, while drugged, uh, Magda Goebbels and uh, a doctor, an SS doctor, had forced open their jaws and um, put, put cyanide capsules in their mouths. The bodies of Goebbels and his wife were burned as well, 
Their charred remains were found and identified by Soviet troops. July 1945. This rarely seen film shot by the American army shows the devastation of Berlin. What the bombs and the street fighting hadn't obliterated, the Red Army destroyed after VE Day. In 1947, military personnel in the Soviet zone set explosive charges in what remained of Hitler's bunker. They also razed the ruins of the Reich Chancellery next door. So it was just covered over uh, and nothing more was said about it. And everybody in the, in the West had assumed that they had blown it up completely. In 1988, a year before the Berlin Wall fell, one further attempt at demolition took place. This time at the bidding of East German officials. Where is Hitler's bunker in modern Berlin? No signs exist to mark the spot, but its location is not a secret. Surrounded by residential tower blocks, less than a kilometre from the Brandenburg Gate, the Führer bunker's remains lie beneath this car park. Whether or not to acknowledge the site is controversial. The secrecy of the bunker, especially the way that it was maintained first of all by the Nazis as secret and then by the Soviet authorities uh, as a secret area and cordoned off, has obviously uh, greatly contributed to the myth of the bunker and its uh, image of a secret, uh, a secret end and a secret place. Well, I think that the ground in Berlin, uh, generally spoken, is poisoned. Sibylla Quack heads a foundation that honours the murdered Jews of Europe. She believes the bunker's remains should be acknowledged for very specific reasons. I don't think they should be preserved as a museum. And I think it's very important that we educate people and that we tell them how it happened and who did it and where it was done. But we did not want this special place as a place to commemorate Hitler. Artifacts of the bunker's history are scattered about in archives and museums throughout Germany and Russia, but nobody knows what still exists of the original structure. To piece together the puzzle of Hitler's bunker, Unsolved History has assembled a multidisciplinary team of experts. What we can bring forth, I think, by doing this study together is an accurate depiction of these bunkers and what the Fuhrer bunker was like in uh, 1945. Daniel Martinez is Unsolved History's chief investigator. <laughs> Dietmar Arnold is Berlin's leading bunker expert. The Alfred Kerndl is the former chief of archaeology for the city of Berlin. I was responsible for magnetic measurements, which were... Gerd Plowman specializes in sonar ground mapping. Yeah. Put into something concrete. Nikolai Lukov can turn data into three-dimensional images. Looks like a real thing. Vice Chancellor Gibbons. And Rochus Misch was one of Hitler's SS bodyguards in the bunker. Troubled by the past, he will help verify the accuracy of our reconstruction. The team will use 21st century techniques and technologies to recreate Hitler's bunker. Along the way, they'll examine certain myths about the place in the cold light of science. There were actually two Berlin bunkers used by Hitler during the war. The four, or upper bunker, was built in 1935 as an air raid shelter. It housed the kitchens, staff quarters and, at the end of the war, was home to the Goebbels family. Hitler's inner sanctum, the lower, or Führer bunker, was built in 1943. The upper and lower sections were connected by a rectangular stairwell.
entry to Hitler's private rooms and personal headquarters was strictly controlled. The team hopes to learn more about Hitler's bunker by visiting other wartime bunkers beneath Berlin. The Gesundbrunnen bunker is reached through a U-Bahn entrance. As in wartime London, Berlin's underground stations served as civilian air raid shelters. But some were considerably more elaborate than the tube platforms that protected Londoners from German bombs. Now we stay here in the second level. These are the stairs going down the, the subway. Stairs, yes, that's right. And this is where the track is? Yes, here you can see the, metro, uh, the subway channel here. You know, I found it very cool, and I always shivered, and apparently uh, Hitler preferred cooler temperatures. Accommodations in the civilian bunkers were in stark contrast to those in the Führer bunker. Unlike the average Berliner, Hitler still had the luxury of a flush toilet. The only uh, part of all the complex that was clean and smelled clean and the toilets were working was the upper and the lower bunker. I don't even know who cleaned them. There was no cleaning woman or anything ever inside. It must have been Hitler's valet. As in the Führer bunker, ventilation systems circulated the air. Normally this works with electric motors, uh -huh. but if it's the electric power works not here inside. It you goes can, out. It's go out. You can do a move all by hand. Although Hitler's bunker also had this manual capability, there were backup generators to ensure that power was not interrupted. Nobody living below could escape the sound. I'm sure the walls were soundproof, except for the noise from the ventilators, and it was like a humming sound. I don't know what to compare it with. It was not a normal sound, it was a penetrating sound. The bunker was a sealed system, so air pressure needed to be maintained. And there was another unusual safety precaution. What would happen if the lights went out? Well, we can show you, we can make the light out, if it's possible. Uh, it's illuminated color, and if I go here with a uh, flashlight over, you can see this, you can make a graffiti temporarily. That's you incredible. Know? You can see this. Always present were weapons, ready to be fired at the approaching Russians. That's a sight about this one. People. Although there were thousands of bunkers scattered about wartime Berlin, nowhere was the concentration so dense as near the Reich Chancellery, beneath the ministerial gardens. These were designed to protect the chief agents of the Third Reich, ministers, top military officers and support staff. Albert Speer, Hitler's chief architect, was responsible for their construction. The Führer bunker was the most important and best defended of these structures. On January the 31st, 1945, Soviet tanks crossed the Oder River, the traditional frontier between Poland and Germany. No further natural boundaries remained between Stalin's army and Berlin. Three days later, a massive Allied bombing raid forced Hitler to move his headquarters down to the bunker for good. Has anything survived the two separate attempts to obliterate the Führer bunker? Historian Dietmar Arnold and archaeologist Alfred Kerndl will survey the site. Geophysicist Gerd Plaumann and an assistant are already at work with the magnetometer. The bunker was constructed of concrete, reinforced with iron rods. The magnetic sensor can detect iron underground. If the concrete is still there, then the rods are too. To make sure the results of this survey can be fitted accurately into city maps and records, key reference points on the grid are marked and fixed by GPS registration.
Gad's assistant notes any surface objects which might form obstacles or turn out to be useful as visual reference points. As the field is crisscrossed, measurements are taken. Something is still there. The data has been collected. Now begins the painstaking work of processing the information. It would help to find visual records of any of the bunker's features. Not easily achieved with a top secret installation. But hidden in the vaults of the National Archives in Washington, D.C., lie vital clues from the past. In this case, footage taken in Berlin in July of 1945 by an American army cameraman. It shows the windows of Hitler's reception hall, overlooking the park-like grounds of the Reich Chancellery. The camera pans to the bunker's exhaust tower, often mistaken as a guard tower. Then, a close-up of the emergency exit used to remove Hitler's body before it was burned. The camera pans again to the exhaust tower and the emergency release door. A wide shot shows the bomb damage to the chancellery roof. And another view of the bunker's emergency exit and exhaust tower. This extraordinary film shows what the exterior of the bunker looked like. But Hitler never allowed photographs of its interior. Only a few post-war images shot by the Soviets have survived. One shows the wreckage of Hitler's private bedroom and the sitting room next door where he took his life. Ava Braun most likely sat on this sofa when she poisoned herself. And here, the guards watch room, leading to the emergency exit. After taking these pictures, the Soviets and later the East Germans did their best to destroy all traces of the bunker. But, ironically, East German efforts to keep Berlin divided during the Cold War actually preserved what little remained. After the wall came down in 1989, secret files from East German archives became accessible to researchers. One of these would prove enormously helpful to our team of experts. Although Soviet occupiers blew up Hitler's bunker in 1947, their work was incomplete. Then, for 25 years, under first Russian, then East German rule, the site lay in a sort of no-man's land, meters away from the dividing line between East and West Berlin. During that time, the Berlin Wall was built. The area was kept clear of new construction so it could be patrolled, and the ruins of Hitler's bunker rested, undisturbed. But in 1972, in an attempt to block all conceivable escape routes under the Berlin Wall, the Stasi, East Germany's secret police, sent teams down into Hitler's bunker. And they took photographs of what they found. Emblematic of the paranoia of the time, the Stasi officers who participated in the operation obscured their own faces. but their photographs give us a sense of what the bunker's interior was like. This is the machine room in the upper bunker. These could be the beds where Josef and Magda Goebbels' six children slept and died. 
The stairs going to the lower bunker are rectangular. There is no spiral staircase, as many historians have insisted. And this is the ruin of the Führer bunker itself. The story of its construction begins in November of 1940, a time when Hitler's boast that his Third Reich would last a thousand years was believed by many, at least in Germany. Hitler's conviction that he would prevail is always a difficult thing to say because his mind often operated on two different levels. And towards the end, a lot of German generals began to wonder whether Hitler had a a fundamental sort of subconscious desire to lose. I mean, some of his decisions were so crazy and so self-destructive uh, that his mind really did seem to be operating in a sort of contradictory fashion. Adolf Hitler's seat of power, the Reich Chancellery, was designed by Albert Speer, his favorite architect. It was leveled by the Russians after the war. But in 1940, it presented a formidable facade to any visitor. Here is where it stood. And here is the location of the Führer bunker in the ministerial garden. Attached to it, the upper or four bunker, built in the mid-1930s. Over here, the recently excavated driver's bunker. Under the entire complex, the water table was high, making underground construction difficult. I was living there. I went down the corridor and saw a huge pit was being dug by a mechanical digger. And I said, what's that going to be? Are we getting a swimming pool? No, no, they said. We are building a bunker here. Final construction of the lower bunker began in the summer of 1943, under conditions of utmost secrecy. But a British air reconnaissance photograph taken that autumn shows signs of the secret project underway. Here is the building site. This photograph holds some of the keys to the mystery of the bunker. In a nondescript office park outside Washington, D.C., is a facility that analyzes potential military targets. This team has many years of photoanalytical experience. Now they're going to apply their know-how to the aerial photograph of Berlin from 1943. What does the photograph reveal about the construction of Hitler's bunker? And what could it have told the Allies in 1943? We were asked to look at specific features of the Reich's Chancellery complex, which was the nerve center of Hitler's Germany. That's the formal entrance. But that's, the, that's no construction. This is, this is. Using the most advanced digital technology available today, as well as techniques available in 1943, the experts go to work. They are camouflage and covering something. Oh, absolutely. That's right, and that's the only camouflage netting that we've been able to identify. Other than natural. Yeah. Although the builders clearly took pains to conceal the bunker's construction, details begin to emerge. Yeah, it rises up. To the left of these formal gardens, we have a very long, rectangular structure. Now this is a formal gardening area again, but under stereo, it's more than what meets the eye. We have something here that is underground. So that whole area is an extensive effort to camouflage. As we move further down, we can see construction activity, and here we can see distinctive shadowing. It's definitely underground construction, and then the question is, how are they removing the material? If you look with care, you'll see there's a truck and the back end of the truck is into the structure. Definitely something going on there. The analysts believe that the bunker's construction was...
carefully concealed. With the excavated dirt being moved from here to here, where trucks like this one would drive it away. Could British military intelligence in 1943 have detected this concealed building project and recognised its significance? Could the RAF have targeted and destroyed the bunker and Hitler in a single go? Rockus Misch, one of Hitler's phone operators, was privy to Nazi intelligence intercepts. Rechtzeitig Meldung bekommen von England. Da hatten da auch unsere Leute gehabt. Die konnten schon mal voraussagen, dass ein Luftangriff auf Berlin stattfindet, oder nicht? Es ging da alles über, über Telefonie, über die Vermittlung. Perhaps the only viable way of killing Hitler in his bunker would have been by an assassin from his inner circle. It is a conceivable scenario. Waren Sie eigentlich bewaffnet? Wer? Da unten. Ich? Ja. Äh, was war eine 765er. Eine Walter oder was? Du weißt ja, ob es Walter eine 700, ja, Walter, ja. Walter Pistole, 765. Die habe ich auf dem, neben dem Vermittlerscharm durchgezogen, geladen, vor allem mir immer liegen gehabt. Und dann hätten Sie also als eine Art Selbstmordattentäter ja. sozusagen, wenn Sie jetzt ja. irgendwo wie Ben Laden. On this Waffen SS belt buckle, found in the driver's bunker, are the words, Meine Ehre heißt Treue. My honor is loyalty. The men around Hitler were armed and dangerous, but apparently not a danger to Hitler. Were there other ways that Hitler could have been killed in his bunker? There were high-ranking members of the Nazi regime who had the opportunity and maybe intention to kill Adolf Hitler. People like Hitler's chief architect, Albert Speer. In his memoirs, and at his war crimes trial in Nuremberg, Speer claimed that in February of 1945, he conceived of a plan to introduce poison gas into the Führer bunker. One month later, he testified, when it came time to implement his plan, a huge concrete shaft had been built, preventing him access to the vents. This claim arouses skepticism in those who were there. The bombardment was so heavy and so constant that even if he would have gone to all these intakes, he wouldn't have survived. And everybody would have no despair. It has also come to light that the concrete shaft was erected before Speer conceived his alleged plan. I've always been very dubious about Speer's claim. I think that it was pretty impractical, even if it had been physically possible. And secondly, I think it was part of Speer's um, confused thinking at that particular time uh, on what his real relationship was with Adolf Hitler. Evidently, Albert Speer lied about his scheme to escape the judgment of the court and of history. But other bunker mysteries remain. As his data is fed into the computer, Gerd Plowman's geomagnetic survey starts to bear fruit. He begins with a street model of Berlin in the late 1980s, when the wall still stood. We load now a picture of the buildings which were there during the war. To the wartime computer model, buildings that once stood on the spot are added. The blue lines show the buildings which were visible on the surface. Green lines line out the structures which were not visible on the subsurface. The white areas show locations with no magnetic anomalies. The red areas are magnetic hits, presumably iron rods. As the bunker's ceiling was destroyed long ago, the red corresponds to surviving walls. After transforming our data, let's zoom in now to our area of interest. Slowly, the bunker's skeleton begins to emerge. This is the final result. This is very close to the, to the map and to the position of the Führerbunker. 
for the first time in decades, the exact location of the bunker complex is pinpointed. A surprising amount of the structure has survived two attempts to destroy it. Based on this survey and archival research, the bunker was divided like this, with wide corridors running through its chambers, surrounded by thick, bomb-proof walls. Hitler's thousand-year Reich lasted only 12 years. His bunker has apparently survived much longer. But the investigation doesn't end here. The East German Stasi photographs from 1972 show portions of the bunker's interior. The 1945 US Army footage shows its above-ground structures. The magnetic survey has revealed the bunker's underground outline. Only one thing is missing. Construction details. Uh, where were you on this plan? As the original plans were destroyed in the war, they need to be replicated after the fact. A difficult task under any circumstances. Dietmar, by compiling plans and getting an accurate depiction of this, that's going to be a challenge for us because so many plans were wrong. Now I make only a plan reconstruction. And I like to take away the mysticism of this area. Um, I will try to recreate the bunker in 3D based on mostly Dietmar Arnold's plans and all the experience from other people we can collect. Help comes from an unexpected source. Someone caught in a tailback at the right time and place. Erhard Schreuer is an artist and book illustrator. In 1988, one year before the Berlin Wall fell, Schreier was trying to deliver some of his artwork to the East German State Publishing House when traffic came to a halt. The police had blocked the road because of blasting. Schreier didn't know that he had stumbled on the second attempt to destroy the Führer bunker. Curious, after the meeting with his publishers, he returned to the site. There was no guard, so he approached the demolition workers. Schreuer was an amateur historian. He recognized the significance of his discovery and the consequences to history once the bunker was destroyed for good. He grabbed his sketchbook and made several highly detailed drawings that fill in some of the missing details of the bunker's design. Fourteen years later, Schreuer shared these sketches and his insights with our investigative team. Here is the bunker's ceiling, complete with steel girders. Das ist nämlich auf Befehl von Hitler so gemacht worden. Mm -hmm. Aus seiner Geschichte vom Ersten Weltkrieg. Er wollte ja. also immer Schreuer's sketches were exacting. His measurements show that the outer walls were superior to most bunkers, four meters thick, not 3.5 meters, as was standard at the time. Hier ist der Vorbunker. The two corners of the bunker closest to the chancellery were cut at a 45 degree angle probably to deflect the concussion from a bomb blast. This reconstruction, with the ceiling removed, shows how the rest of the lower bunker was configured. Armed with these last pieces of information, Dietmar Arnold and Nikolai Lukov apply the data to their digital model. They plan to reconstruct the bunker in three dimensions, creating a virtual tour of the subterranean Nazi complex. 
The final data comes from eyewitness Rockus Misch. Once the three-dimensional model is complete, Rockus Misch compares it to his own memories of 1945. Ja, wir, wir gehen jetzt runter in den Hauptbunker, ja. die Treppe runter. Ja. Hier ist ein Wachposten, ja. ist das richtig? Ja, der Karl Weichelt hier sitzt. Rockus confirms the model's accuracy. For the first time since 1945, Hitler's infamous bunker, the scene of his dramatic suicide, can be revisited. So what are we looking at here? This is our final animation of a walkthrough of Hitler's bunker. Although the notorious Führer bunker is gone, after meticulous scientific reconstruction, we can still pay a virtual visit. Now this place is so stark, it's like a prisoner, a tomb. The main entrance to the bunker was underneath the reception hall of the Reich Chancellery. There were two portals, one at the southeast corner and one at the northeast corner. Once below, there were airlock chambers to pass through. Then a guard station by the entrance to the central corridor of the upper bunker. Next was the canteen, where SS guards, secretaries, and even the Goebbels' children might have been sitting. On the right was the machine room. On the left, the kitchens. Proceeding on, past the Goebbels' family quarters and the kitchen staff quarters, one encountered the staircase that led to Hitler's lower bunker. Here was another SS guard. Once he permitted entrance, there was a waiting room. The first room on the right was the machine room. Through a central door, one could enter either Hitler's small conference room or leave by an emergency exit. On the way to this exit was the Honda bunker, the dog bunker, where Hitler kept his favorite Alsatian, Blondie. Through that, one would be beneath the tower in the garden, the main air outlet. Here were the stairs for the emergency exit, up which the bodies of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun were carried to the garden to be burned. Back through these doors in the waiting room, one can enter Hitler's private chambers. First was this workroom, and finally, his private study. Off that was Hitler's bedroom. Through its doorway, one can look back towards the study, where Hitler and Eva Braun ended their lives. The bunker today symbolizes really that final grotesque collapse of the Third Reich of the Nazi regime. And the way that, you know, Hitler uh, and uh, Goebbels uh, and the, some of the others killed themselves uh, in this um, sort of squalid concrete hole under the ground uh, really sort of summed up the end of that particular regime. What does the future hold for this bunker? Opinion is divided, and emotions run high. Some want the bunker site to remain unmarked. They want to forget the horror that was Hitler. Others feel that reminders of the past will keep history from repeating itself. There is already a memorial less than 100 meters away from the bunker's location. Not to Hitler, but to the millions of innocent victims of his madness. I think it's very important that the site of the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe will be in the heart of the new and old capital of Germany. It's very important that it is at a site where the murder had been planned. This is very close to where Hitler worked and made those plans to murder the European Jewry really fits. What do we want to do with this place? 
a natural fear that neo-Nazi groups might want to turn it into a shrine uh, to Hitler. This leads one on to the question of what sort of monument should be allowed to remain. Um, would it be a good idea to preserve it and open it up perhaps in years to come when the threat of a neo-Nazi uh, shrine is over? Or should it be destroyed completely? As a historian, I, I don't believe in destroying things. I think that, in fact, it should be uh, maintained or preserved. But I think that the argument for restricting or preventing, perhaps, public access uh, has a lot of justification. The real Nazis, they know where the bunkers are. The real danger for re-mystification is when you take it away, then you leave room for fantasy and so on. We, uh, we, there is no need to fear uh, the ashes of Nazism. This virtual journey through Hitler's bunker has come about through the combined efforts of experts from many fields. It answers several questions over which historians have puzzled since the end of the Second World War. But the biggest questions of all remain. How could the man who died a coward's death in his underground hiding place have gained so much power? How could any one person have fostered so much hatred? And how, in a supposedly civilized age, could so many millions of innocent people have been murdered? The Führer bunker, which lay nearby, he was one of the last people to see Hitler alive. The last days I had no conception whatsoever um, what time it was. Sometimes I even lost the sense of it was day or night because uh, there was so much smoke out there. Rocker Smish was a young sergeant in Hitler's SS bodyguard detachment. He was also the bunker's telephone operator. There were civilians as well that had our telephone number, friends and acquaintances. They called us asking for help. Goebbels tried to reassure them, and I did too, that they should hold out. Yes, they said, but people are being raped. On the 20th of April 1945, as a thousand British and American planes rained bombs on Berlin, Adolf Hitler descended into his bunker for the last time. It was his 56th birthday. Several top Nazi officers urged him to surrender to the Allies. He refused. They urged him to leave Berlin while he still could. He would not. When the first artillery shells um, landed uh, close to the bunker, Hitler came out unshaven from his room um, and uh, yelling, I mean, I'm appalled and sort of gesticulating, saying, what's happening? And Hitler was shaken um, to realize that the Russians really were at the gates of Berlin. As the Red Army began shelling the city, Jost the final months of the Second World War, in Europe, the tide had turned. The Nazis had been rebuffed in a final costly fight, the Battle of the Bulge. But still, the Third Reich would not concede defeat. Allied forces entered Germany in January of 1945. British and Americans from the West, Russians from the East. In Berlin, Adolf Hitler spent his last months in a subterranean fortress, the Führer bunker. What exactly went on in Hitler's hiding place? And what did it look like? Do traces remain despite two attempts to obliterate it? Using the latest technology and eyewitness accounts, we'll reconstruct the infamous bunker, exposing the place where one of the most wicked men in history met his end.
Modern day Berlin, a city united and at peace. Half a century ago, it was a different place. At the end of April in 1945, the capital of Hitler's Third Reich was in ruins. For months, it had been heavily bombarded by Allied aircraft. Soviet artillery had shelled the city for days as Red Army troops advanced towards the center. Their objective? The symbols of the hated Nazi regime. The Reich Chancellery, the headquarters of the SS, and the Gestapo. Under the rubble was the bunker where Hitler had been hiding for almost three months. The bunker has captured the public imagination, mainly because it was the final death rattle, grotesque death rattle of the Third Reich. German resistance was sporadic but fanatical. Berlin's defenders were mostly teenagers, fiercely loyal members of the Hitler Youth. Many German soldiers, including officers, had fled the city. They hoped to surrender to British and American troops rather than face the rumored savagery of the Soviets. For the city's civilians, conditions had become intolerable weeks earlier. Many of them were so desperate to get food ready for the siege that they would still stand in line in the street, uh, either queuing for bread or even for water, because by that stage the water supplies had broken down, as well as electricity. And many women were slaughtered or literally blown to pieces uh, in the open. Few people who witnessed Hitler's final weeks are alive today. But two who once walked the corridors of the Führerbunker survive. Armin Lehmann was a member of the Hitler Youth. Given bicycles with bazookas strapped to them, these boys were ordered to take on huge Russian tanks. Armin was a runner. His job took him to the bunkers of the Reich Chancellery and to Zuf Goebbels, Hitler's propagandist, joined his Führer. He brought his wife, Magda, and their six children with him. After the assassination attempt on Hitler's life in July of 1944, even top officers were relieved of their sidearms and searched before being allowed in the Führer's presence. By late April, only his inner circle remained. His mistress, Eva Braun, Goebbels and his family, and a few trusted aides. The bunker's four meter thick walls protected the small group. Huge ventilators circulated air 11 meters below ground. There was enough food, water, and champagne to last for one more month. In Berlin, the secret bunkers of World War II are largely forgotten. Just occasionally, usually by accident, one comes to light. In 1990, workers were preparing a site for a concert to celebrate the fall of the war. The Reich Chancellery and gardens had once stood on the same spot. After the wall was constructed in 1960, it became a so-called death zone, booby-trapped by East German police to discourage escapees. The workers stumbled on an underground structure that had been used by the SS Motor Corps known as the Fahrer, or Driver's Bunker. On its walls, grim pictures from the time remain. This bunker also contained artifacts, each one with a story behind it. A dagger that had been worn by a member of the loyal Hitler Youth. Remnants of an Enigma machine used to code and to decode secret messages sent by the German High Command. A 
and petrol cans, perhaps those used to douse the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun after death. The two had married in the Führer bunker less than 48 hours before their suicide. Although Hitler's underground lair has inspired much speculation since the war ended, strangely, very little is known about it. Its location is unmarked, its true dimensions uncertain, but for those who experienced life there in the final weeks of the war, the memories are vivid. We heard it if a shell or a heavy bomb hit the exit tower. There was concrete we could hear.